Well, good to see everybody this morning. Glad you could join us online. So as most of you know, we've been working our way through this letter that Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. We've actually been in it since Easter last year. As soon as Easter was over, we launched into it, and we're continuing to work our way slowly and deliberately through it. And each week, as God continues to unveil some truths to us, some powerful truths in our lives, there's sort of this underlying theme that kind of guides and directs all that goes on in this letter that Paul writes. And that is that whatever it is that we believe shapes our behavior. And if we think about that, it's actually all throughout the entirety of our lives, especially in those big things that we involve ourselves with. For example, if we believe that we're called to a certain profession, then we behave by getting the credentials we need, the training we need, or the degrees we need to actually prosecute that particular profession in our lives. But it also happens with the everyday minutia decisions. For example, if we actually believe the weathermen around here that it's gonna rain today, then we typically behave by grabbing our umbrella on the way out the door. But ultimately, if we really wanna know what it is that we believe, we should look at our behavior. Because we say a lot of things that we believe, but our behavior isn't in step with it. So that is exactly why Paul is specifically focused here in chapter four on the behavior of the church. In fact, he identified several behaviors you see up there in orange that he thinks result from a core belief that we learned back in chapters one through three, the belief portion, and that is that God's master plan set in place before the foundation of the world is to unite all things in Christ. And God does this through his church by calling them to respond to those five behaviors you see up there that are necessary for unity. And of course, humility lies at the core. We talked about that all through Advent. And from that, we get these fruits of the Spirit that start to appear in our lives. Things like gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love so that we are eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, because that's God's cosmic plan. So unity must characterize the life of the church, and as Paul shows us, it's the work of the Trinity. Paul writes, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And of course, today we'll be studying the part you see up there in orange, but if you want to get caught up, if you missed the last couple of weeks, you can always catch these sermons online. So two weeks ago, we looked at the unifying work of the third person of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit, as we studied one body, one spirit, one hope. We learned there's only one way to become part of the body of Christ, and that's when we place our faith in Jesus and the Holy Spirit takes up residence within us, sealing our identity in Christ, where the one spirit sanctifies us. He makes us more Christ-like until that one day when we're glorified in his presence for all eternity, and that is what our one hope is in. So the unifying work of the Holy Spirit works through one body, one spirit, and one hope. And then last week, we studied the unifying work of the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, as we studied one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. Our one Lord is Jesus. There's no other Lord. And he was sent to bear the penalty of our sin so that we might be made right with God. And of course, the mechanism of one faith in Christ is how it plays out in our lives. When it happens, we receive one baptism. And our focus then is not so much on the water, but what the water represents. That's what we learned last week. It's a sign and seal of the new covenant, being born again into a new life in Christ, set apart as God's adopted children with a new identity in him. So this week, we're going to tackle the third grouping, God the Father. Paul writes, there is one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, this is a remarkable statement on so many levels because it's vital to our understanding of who God is 
So we got to spend some time with this, kind of like a dog spends with a bone. Now, why that example? Well, Eugene Peterson, he writes this book called Eat This Book. I strongly commend it to you. And in it, he uses this illustration of a dog and a bone to show us how we must approach Scripture. And we've all kind of been there before, I'm sure. The family dog comes prancing up to show us her newfound treasure, this bone that she just discovered. And she kind of runs all over the yard trying to get your attention so you'll be proud of her. We've all kind of seen this, courting your approval that she actually discovered this bone of hers. And of course, you lavish praise, don't you? You say, good dog, good dog. And then she takes it to the favorite corner of the yard and she starts gnawing on it, making those happy, growling sounds. It's good, isn't it? it it's always good to have a hue in your, in your congregation. Thanks. So after devoting significant time to working that bone over, she buries it in a special place where only she can find it. So the next day, she can frantically dig it back up again and enjoy and savor it some more. And that is how we must treat Scripture, kind of like a dog treats a bone, treasuring it. And that's why it seems to take us so long. I know many of you often say, why are we still in Ephesians? Why does it seem to take so long? Well, actually, we probably won't even finish chapter 4 until into the summertime. So that's just what we do here. We gnaw on that bone. So Paul starts this part here with two very critical words. He says, one God. Now, I know you've seen this graphic before, but again, it's something that we have to just continue to gnaw on. Because if we're not careful, the Trinity paradox can trip us up in our understanding of these two words, one God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. But on the other hand, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father. They are three persons in one God, each with a separate and unique identity. The Father is the creator and sustainer of the universe, the Son, Savior, and Lord of the world, and the Holy Spirit the sanctifier of God's people. So important that we understand those roles. But they are still one God. The three persons of the Trinity are united. They're one. So much so that Scripture tells us that the Father actually sent the Son. He sent him to dwell among us, to pay the penalty of our sin. And then the Father and the Son sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. And the Holy Spirit always points us back to Jesus. And Jesus is the one who justifies us and makes us right before the Father. So you can see how they're united in their love for God's adopted children, and they're united in the saving work of one God. And that's why we must be absolutely clear about the unity of the Trinity, because it gives us a right perspective. And there's at least two reasons why we need a right perspective. First of all, to grasp the truth of who God is, but second of all, to grasp the truth of who we are. Because as Paul keeps teaching us, there's a really powerful shot in the arm we keep getting, and that is that we need to get over ourselves. He keeps showing us that that is our biggest problem in life. I know if you watch the news, they're going to tell you your biggest problem is inflation or China or something like that, but that is not our biggest problem. As Paul keeps reminding us, it is ourselves. And when we say that we need to get over ourselves, we aren't referring to our worth because each of us were uniquely created by God. So we have cosmic worth, but we need to get over ourselves so we can focus on God's plan for us. So how do we do that? Well, it starts by seeing our God for who he is. He's the creator and sustainer of the universe, sovereign over all, in complete control of absolutely everything, all present, all powerful, all knowing, and he is good. He's the very definition of love, perfectly holy, and he's the author of truth. Whatever he says, it happens. 
When he promises something, it always comes to fruition. And he promises this truth, that he will unite all things in Christ through his church. That's through you, and that's through me. So our existence is much cosmically bigger than all that we have going on in our little lives right now. And that's why it's so important that we have this right perspective here, that we serve one God. I trust at some point or another that we've all been a part of something bigger than ourselves. Maybe it's being a part of a band. Maybe it's being a part of a team or just your workplace, being a part of a work environment that's engaged in something bigger than ourselves. I know for me, I first experienced it profoundly when I graduated from high school and went off to college at the United States Military Academy at West Point. The first six weeks that you are there are called beast, and it truly is a beast, because what they're trying to do is help you get a different perspective on life, to help you get over yourself, to get your focus on your role that you play as part of the army and as part of the nation's defense. So they cut your hair kind of tight, they put you all in the same uniform, they get you up early, and they run you ragged all day. And through it all, there's this constant drumbeat. Do your duty with honor for your country. And over the course of the four years, your perspective continues to evolve to the point where you actually realize that the military machine you've just joined is so much bigger than you. It's got a mission of defending borders, promoting democracy, building nations, saving lives. And even though you're just one of thousands who wear the uniform, you realize the Army actually counts on you to play a vital role. And that's only a mere fraction of the perspective we must have with regard to each of our role in God's army. So we have one God, and then Paul adds, and Father of all. So let's now turn our attention to this word all, because it can tend to trip us up as well. For example, some read this as evidence that God is the Father of all people. In other words, everyone will be united in him. But that's again why we can't separate belief from behavior, and it's also why we must always put things in their context. Because the word all actually refers to God's adopted children. And how do we see that? Well, first, chapters one through three that we spent most of the fall going through, they are all about belief, and in particular about how God adopts his children. Second, look at the context. Paul's talking about the church, the faithful, in Christ Jesus, one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's what we've been studying for the past few weeks. And then third, take a look at the rest of the sentence. Over all, through all, and in all, God only indwells his adopted children once they've placed their faith in Jesus. So do you see why we kind of have to gnaw at this bone of scripture? Otherwise, we'd miss the truth of it. So the phrase, Father of all, refers to God as the Father of his church, who is over, through, and in it all. So now let's take a quick look at these three prepositions that Paul gives us. Our one God and Father is over all his church. By over, Paul means he is the authority over the church's existence. So he directs it, but especially with regard to unity. As the creator of all things, God created man to be in a direct relationship with him. That's how things were back in the garden. But as we know, man rebelled, sin entered the world, and man was separated from God. But God the Father is merciful, and he had a plan to save his adopted children. That plan involved sending his son to pay the penalty for our sin by dying on the cross and shedding his blood, spending three days in a tomb and then being resurrected to life, conquering sin once and for all. The Father and the Son then sent the Holy Spirit, as we already said, to indwell those who have placed their faith in Jesus and to build and to unite God's church with Jesus as the head and the saints as the body, the believers. The Holy Spirit also then sanctifies believers, pointing them to Jesus, convicting, counseling, comforting them, making them more Christ-like, 
All the while, Jesus is mediating and advocating on their behalf to the Father because he loves them. And on that day of judgment, the Father will look on his children as he looks on his son, whom if you recall, he loves him and he's well pleased with him. That one day we'll all be loved and God will be pleased with us. And we'll be able to stand in his holiness, sin completely gone, not by anything we did, but because of the work of Jesus the Son and because of the work of the Holy Spirit, bringing God's church, the Father's adopted children, into his glory for all eternity. That's the salvation story. And God the Father is over it all. The Father is not only over it all, but he is through all. He is the creator and sustainer of the universe. He sustains whatever it is that he creates, and he does that through his providential care. In his sovereignty and in his goodness, he works all things out for our good and for God's glory. His providential hand moving through the ups and the downs of our lives, moving through the challenges of raising a family, paying the bills, getting along with coworkers and neighbors, through sickness, injuries, surgeries, earthquakes, train wrecks, through the everyday ordinary of life. He's moving in it all. Even if we don't see it or if we don't feel it, he's always working in it. Now, as a pastor, people love to come up to me and share the remarkable stories of when God sometimes shows up in their life. They'll say things like, boy, God worked a powerful thing today. Or we even saw it as a nation when Damar Hamlin had that really tough medical situation with the bills, and the whole nation kind of got around him and prayed, and we saw it was a remarkable thing. And all these stories that you tell, they're truly remarkable. But God does it a hundred billion times every single day. Every single breath we take, it's a new grace, a new mercy. God's providential hand working through it all, the ups and the downs in our everyday ordinary life. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. These miracles are happening all around us all the time. We must have this perspective. As Paul writes to the church in Rome, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Those who love God are the people who comprise his church, those who are called according to his purpose to serve and glorify their master as he works through them. So there is one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Now this one should take our breath away. Because if we've placed our faith in Jesus, then God the Father is in us. Did you know that? That God dwells in his people, not in a temple, not in a church building, but in his people. And how do we see that from scripture? Well, first, Jesus teaches us in John chapter 14 that the Holy Spirit will be in you. And I think most of us have grasped that. We kind of get that. But then later, in part of Jesus' farewell discourse, before he goes off to the cross, he mentions multiple times that he too will be in us. Paul actually referenced that truth in his prayer for the church that we studied before Advent when he prayed that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. And we see right here that God the Father is also in all of his adopted children. And that's why in addition to praying that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, Paul also prayed that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then Jesus further builds on God's plan for unity in his prayer that he prayed before he was betrayed in the garden. He prays this, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you loved me. That's really a remarkable 
set of words there for us to focus on, to think about. So through this two-letter word, in, we not only learn about the degree of oneness of the Trinity, but we also see the degree of oneness that God demands of his church. But even more remarkable, we see how God also desires the oneness with his children. It's amazing. It's actually breathtaking when we think about it. And that is why Paul lays it out the way he does, that there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So for our response time today, I invite you all to stand, and we're going to sing this song of praise to our one God and loving Father.